The Holy Gospel according to Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. The Gospel of the Lord. This year's readings for Lent were in cycle B, which means we're reading a lot from the Gospel of Mark. But this year in Lent, we hear a lot of promises. Each week, our first reading tells us of one of the promises or covenants that God made with their people. Last week, we heard the story of God's promise to Noah and his family after the flood. Noah and his descendants didn't have to do anything to make this happen. Only God was bound by this promise. This week, we hear another promise. God's promise to Abram and Sarai that they would have numerous offspring. This time, there are requirements for the people involved. First, God changes their names to Abraham and Sarah. And they need to walk before God and be blameless. Well, we also hear some promises in today's gospel reading. They aren't phrased that way, but they are promises. And they have a very different tone than God's covenants made throughout the Hebrew scriptures. God makes the promise, Jesus makes the promise, that he will undergo great suffering and be rejected by the chief priests and be killed. Peter, of course, does not like the sound of this. And his objection is really understandable. He's made considerable sacrifices to follow Jesus. He and his brother Andrew left a thriving fishing business and the security of their Galilean home when Jesus said, follow me. They staked their future on the assumption that Jesus was the long-awaited Messiah, the one who would restore the fortunes of Israel and save all the people. Jesus throws Peter into a crisis of faith when he begins to teach the disciples that he will suffer and be rejected. Peter rebukes Jesus for talking about suffering and death. A suffering Messiah is unthinkable. A Messiah saves people from suffering. But Jesus tells Peter, you're hung up on human things, not divine things. This is followed by another interesting promise. Jesus tells the disciples and the crowd that anyone who wants to follow him will also have to suffer. If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Deny yourself. This is an often misused and misunderstood directive from Jesus. In the past, the, the church has interpreted this statement in a very literal way. In the early centuries of Christianity, many individuals went out into the desert and lived simple and very disciplined lives devoted to prayer and contemplation. We call them the Desert Fathers and Mothers. 
They ate little, owned nothing, and endured heat, drought, and danger. In today's culture, self-denial gets a lot of bad press. We're bombarded by ads that tell us that we should have all the good things life has to offer. We deserve to be treated like the rich and famous. We have a right to drive the very best and most expensive car. Even the beautiful blonde in that hair color commercial some years back told us that she used the more expensive brand because I'm worth it. But Jesus says we should deny ourselves and that self-denial is an essential part of following him. I don't think we all need to become hermits, but I do believe there is place for self-denial. We can't just write it off as an outdated concept. We live in a world where resources are limited. We know, or we should know, that we can't have everything we want when we want it. In the US and Western Europe, we consume far more than is sustainable. Learning to say no to ourselves, to voluntarily limit our consumption, is vital if there's going to be any hope for the future. Self-denial is a skill we need to practice if we are serious about justice, peace, and the future of creation. But self-denial isn't just about material things. We need to rethink by what we mean, what we mean by that little word, self. We talk a lot about the self these days. People say you need to find yourself, know yourself, be yourself. But what is this self we're being and talking about? Who are you? Who am I? And how much of what we think is our self is just a hodgepodge of expectations and assumptions placed on us by our culture. We like to think of ourselves as independent, making our own decisions, shaping our own lives. But for most of us, that's probably not always the way it is. Take the decision about to what to wear. We can wear anything, fig leaves, flannel, nothing at all, although that might get us in trouble. But most of us choose clothes that are remarkably like everyone else's. We may not think we are slaves to fashion, but we take our cues from society and try to fit in. I mean, we have to wear what's available in the store unless we are all creative seamstresses. And even we have to try to fit in, even if fig leaves, flannel, or nothing at all might suit us better. And the way we behave is often shaped by others as well. We're aware of what our society expects us to be like, how we should fill our role. I can't even begin to think of the big book that would be filled of all the shoulds that are attached to being a pastor. One of the biggest challenges Todd and I faced in the early years of our marriage was the expectation hold by, held by all around us that we should have children. We moved to San Luis Obispo and met new people. We had already been married for, what, four years, something like that. And we meet people and they would ask us not if we had children, but how many children we had. And when we answered none, I was teasing Kathy about this because her mom was the one that would always say this to me. They would look uncomfortable and add, yet. You don't have any children yet. I carried my age quite well back then and probably looked like I was still in prime childbearing time. The fact that Todd and I didn't plan to have children, that this was a decision we made before we got married, just didn't fit their preconceived notion of, of a young married couple. So when we talk of being ourselves or knowing ourselves, we need to be aware that ultimately our definition of ourselves is partial, it's temporary, and might be just plain wrong.
According to the Bible, the only person who truly knows us is God. God knows even the parts of ourselves that we prefer to either hide or ignore. And God knows our potential, what we can be in the future, far better than we do. When Jesus tells Peter and the rest of his followers to deny themselves, he isn't talking about giving up chocolate for Lent. He's saying that if you want to follow me, you have to go beyond the image you have of yourself. You have to have the courage to be the people you never thought you could be and do things you never thought you could do. Jesus says to us also, following me means denying yourself, putting the self you know, the self others know behind you, refusing to be limited by it. You know, Holly the eligibility worker? No. Holly the pastor? Just like Peter the fisherman? No. Peter, the head of the church. Abraham and Sarah hear the same message in the Old Testament reading. They thought they knew who they were, just Abram and Sarai, another childless couple in a society in which not having children was a disaster, where children were your security in old age, your assurance that you would not be forgotten and not be alone. They see themselves as people without hope and without a future. But God sees them very differently. As the ancestors of a multitude of nations, the mother and father of kings, they're not who they thought they were. And the new names God gives them are a reminder of that. We are more than we know, different than we thought. And our lives are a journey made into the wonderful mystery of God's vision for us. Denying ourselves is far deeper, far more important, and far more exciting than we may have thought. It's about having the courage to accept that we don't know who we are or who we could become, that we can't put limits on God's plans for us. The final truth about us is in God's hands, and God always has the last word. Amen.